From University of Alberta Alumni Relations, it's What the Job. I'm Matt Ray. One thing I'd say is volunteerism is a really good way to, um, A, fulfill your passions in lots of different ways and to experiment in finding out what you're interested in, right? Like you, you do figure out what you just do what you love. Like volunteerism is an opportunity to just find cool stuff, meet cool people and do cool things. My guest this episode is Racky Pancholi. Racky is a recently elected MLA for Edmonton White Mud. We talk about her seemingly conventional career path from poli-sci grad to lawyer to politician and the actual unconventional path she took to get there. What the Job is made possible with the support of our affinity partner, TD Insurance. Did you know that through the TD Insurance Mellish Monarchs program, University of Alberta alumni are entitled to preferred rates on car, home, condo, and renter's insurance? Save even more by bundling your car and home insurance. To learn more about how you can save, please visit tdinsurance.com slash ualbertaalumni. So what's your name and what's your job? So my name is Racky Pancholi, and I am now the MLA for Edmonton White Mud. And what does an MLA do? What's like the daily day-to-day in the life of an MLA? So I think I'm actually just learning what the day-to-day is, and what I'm actually quickly discovering is that day-to-day is not predictable, and it's not the same. So um, I actually, you know, we were elected on April 16th was election day, and I had thought very hard about everything I'd done up until that night, and then that night happened, and I was thrilled to be elected, and the next day I kind of woke up and was like, Okay, so what now? <laughs> and I really didn't know what the next steps were. Um, and what I found out, it's actually, it's a mix of things. Like I quickly discovered I was going to become a, a, like an employer and an office manager. I had to hire staff. I had to figure out where my constituency officer office was going to be. Um, so there's the logistical things. And then, of course, uh, very quickly, um, we were told we were going to be uh, in the House, in like legislative assembly and acting as MLAs. And I thought, oh, wow, I need to learn how to do that. So actually, there's orientation and such like for that to like actually learn the rules and the traditions and all the things you have to do. But yeah, it's it's kind of like a fire hose of information that comes <laughs> right after you get elected. Yeah. I should know for context, too, that this is May 31st, uh, 2019 That's that right. we're recording, just in case this doesn't come out for months. <laughs> and then people are like, what? Yeah. Um, I, to me, it kind of sounds like you would, it's almost like two different careers from campaigning to being the MLA, is that so? Well, I think an MLA really has, like, wears a few different hats. So the first is that, like, you are essentially are elected to be the representative in your riding, right? So there is the work you need to do to be, um, to get your office set up and to make sure constituents who want to reach you uh, can reach you. But then there's the political stuff, right? And then there's the legislative stuff. So the legislative stuff is actually uh, being in the assembly and learning how to debate bills and learning how to pass motions and all of that. And then there's the political nature of it, which is actually a little bit more like campaigning, which is where you're talking about messaging and social media and you want to make sure you've got some profile and you're talking to people people that, you know, want to talk to you about political issues. And, and that that part, the political stuff, is really a carryover from campaigning. Um, but you realize quickly you've got two other significant roles that are maybe not as glamorous. But yeah, you've got to learn how to actually sit in the House and be a legislator and also how to, you know, be a representative in your riding. So it's like three jobs in one. <laughs> how does the pace feel as overwhelming as it sounds? <laughs> Some days, yeah. I think actually the the trickiest part for me is I I came from working a very... um you know, I wouldn't say nine to five because I was a lawyer in private practice, so my hours weren't nine to five, but a very structured work life, right? Which is that you go into an office at a certain time, you leave at a certain time, and you sit in that office and you do your work. Um, and that's what I was used to. Um, and now all of a sudden, it's a very unpredictable, um, like every day is doing a, a, like a bunch of different types of things, and you're scheduling meetings in, and you're traveling to meet people. And so it's just not a, I wake up and I have to be in the office by 8.30, and I get to leave at 4 30 or 5 it's more like i have evening events weekends events it's it's a lot more fluid and every week changes and every day changes and i, I guess you it'll take a while for you to get used to the <laughs> yeah. to what it is and to know what it yeah, is yeah absolutely how long were you a lawyer so i practiced law for 13 years 
13 long years. <laughs> <laughs> all, all in Alberta? Yeah, well, pretty much. So I actually um, attended law school at University of Toronto. And um, so I articled uh, in Toronto on a Bay Street corporate commercial firm, a big firm. Um, and then uh, got called to the bar in Ontario, but decided that uh, I was going to move back to Edmonton, which is home, and uh, practice here. So the bulk of my practice since being called to the bar has been in Edmonton. And do you find that there are similarities between being a lawyer and being an MLA so far? I definitely think that um, being a lawyer gives me, I don't want to say an edge, but it definitely prepares me for being an MLA. And there's that kind of old cliche of, you know, how many how many elected officials used to be lawyers and still are. And and I do I do tend to hesitate to promote the idea of being a lawyer to be to become an MLA, because I really actually think uh, that our elected body should be made up of a real cross section of people from different backgrounds. Um, and they bring so many different skills um, to the table. I do think that being a lawyer helped me prepare because obviously a lot of uh, being an MLA is being able to, to talk on your feet, um, be comfortable uh, expressing your views. Uh, when I'm in the House, a lot of what I'm doing is debating. I mean, I'm listening to um, what's being proposed and I'm thinking about my arguments about why I support or don't support something. And you don't have a lot of time to prepare. And so you really have to be comfortable with articulating your views quickly. Um, certainly, I mean, the essence of being a legislator, although it's kind of surprising how small of a part of the job this is, is you do have to have some familiarity with legislation um, and actually reading bills and reading those kinds of things. And I think a couple of my colleagues have already noted how how quickly I like to pay attention to those details and I catch on to those details pretty fast, but that's my lawyer brain, right? So um, definitely there's probably a reason why a lot of lawyers go into politics. Um, it, it does prepare you for the skills, but I really, um, I've really appreciated seeing, uh, there's so many of my colleagues uh, right now who aren't lawyers by practice at all and they bring such incredible skills. Um, some communicators, some social workers, former teachers, you know, it's and they bring a different kind of skill set. But uh, definitely, being a lawyer has some advantages. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's tremendous overlap. Uh, I wonder, though, what kind of skills do you think you've needed to that you're like, wow, this doesn't really come from law at all. And I need to like focus on this. Um, so, you know, actually, so one of the things about being a lawyer that's actually made it challenging to be uh, is, is that ability to um, let go of the need to know everything inside and out. Like lawyers tend to be detail oriented, <laughs> no surprise to anybody. And so I, you know, I have this tendency to want to be able to like, I can't speak to something until I have all the information and I've read all the documents and I know it inside and out. And that's the only way I'm going to then get up and talk to it. And that's not the nature of mm -hmm. Being in the House, for sure, as an opposition MLA, you don't have time to prepare. And so you have to be able to stand up and talk even if you don't know it inside and out. Um, and I think, of course, as lawyers, we tend to be linear thinkers. And I don't actually think that politics and issues that directly affect people are always going to be linear. And um, you have to let go of some of that a little bit. So, um, you know, there are definitely times where um, I've, I've been challenged in terms of my tendency to fall back on my type A uh, lawyer qualities and be like, okay, gotta let that go and just do it. But uh, I think I, I am often amazed. I think that uh, I, I don't know how politicians who are not naturally extroverts um, can do this work because, mm -hmm. you know, door knocking in particular when you're campaigning, which isn't just the four week period, you start doing that a long time before that. And a lot of people do it even for like a year before that. I mean, you're basically going up to strangers multiple times a day, an hour, just talking to them. And if you're not comfortable doing that, I can only imagine how emotionally exhausting and mentally exhausting that is. So um, I don't know. I mean, there's lots of introverted lawyers. There's lots of introverts who do go into politics, but I can imagine that's particularly challenging. Yeah, I was, was going to ask, have you met many other politicians who are introverts? I can... I think what I'd say is I can tell that it's a, it's more of a struggle for some people mm -hmm. than others, right? Um, you can tell that the act of doing that is a little bit more exhausting for some people, and they still and I, for the, I think for them to do it is actually even more incredible, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're overcoming that. Whereas I have to say, like I am a natural extrovert. I like talking to people, and even I get exhausted by it, right? And I, my poor husband, at the end of the day, after door knocking for hours, he'd be like, "So how was your day?" And I'd be like, "I just don't want to talk. Can we just <laughs> not talk for a while?" Um, and so I have met some some people who I don't think they would self label as introverts, but I can tell that they're they're working harder 
to to do what uh, for me is a little bit easier to do. Let's talk a little bit about going into law. We'll mm-hmm. go. So you were at U of A to do political science. Yeah. Did you graduate and go right to law? So it took me a little bit of a path to um, to get to decide on political science. I actually entered at U of A and and I thought I was I thought I was going to go to med school. So I was actually in sciences and the typical first year you know undergrad where you're like, wait, I did this first you know a first semester and I was like, this doesn't feel right. Um, and then I switched to commerce actually my second half of my first year and was still kind of going, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. And uh, so then I actually took a year off. I decided I was like, I need to really decide what my interests are. And uh, I don't want to just keep dabbling in things. And uh, it was finding it frustrating a little bit. So I took a year off. I moved to London, England with my best friend. And we worked in pubs for a year. And that's what we did. And while I was there, I thought about what I'd taken over the past year that I did actually enjoy and um, realized that I really liked my history classes. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to come back and I'm going to do switch to a BA and do a history major and poli sci minor. That was the plan. Took, started taking classes and then realized quickly that the poli sci classes were the ones I really just naturally took to. I enjoyed the 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 banter, like I was sitting around a table in small classes, especially where you'd hear some of your, you know, your other people in the class talking about things. I'm like, oh, I really disagree with that. I'm like, why do I disagree with that? And um, sort of figuring out what my own values and thoughts were. And so I really enjoyed that process. So it actually start to finish took me about six years to complete my undergrad at U of A because I also did part time because I was working, um, worked two jobs for a while there. And then I finished it and I thought, well, what's what's next? Um, I had a great poli sci professor. I think he only retired recently from U of A, Don Carmichael. He's a great poli sci prof. And he, I took a lot of classes with him. And he was pushing hard for me to do my master's in poli sci. Um, and I was thinking about that. And then I sort of, I just kind of, I wouldn't say on a whim because I don't want to downplay it. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to try for the LSAT because I like to debate. <laughs> I like to argue. Um, and I just I think I fell a little bit under the glamour of lawyers. And so I was like, I'll, I'll, I studied. I worked hard. to. It's not like I just you know walked in and wrote the LSAT one day. I did practice. Um, but it was not a plan all along to go to law school. It was not that I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't know any lawyers. I think my extent of my experience with lawyers was law and order on TV. So I really, it's not like I had anybody to look at and say, that's what I want to do. It's just I had this sense of I liked the idea of the law. I liked the idea of having something that would equip me to do something else. Um, I don't even think I went to law school thinking I necessarily wanted to be a lawyer. I think I just thought I'm interested, I'm going to do it, and I'm sure I'll get something out of this which will lead me somewhere. Um, And that's the LSAT went well applied to law schools. And I was like, all right, let's go. (laughs) (laughs) And then was being a lawyer just like law and order? (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) In fact, first week of orientation law school, we went out for, we were broke into small groups, went out to orientation dinners with professors. And I think they must have all like agreed to this. They all said it at our dinners. Just so you know, being a lawyer is nothing like law and order. And everybody was like, oh, Um, no, it was not at all. And in fact, I didn't do any litigation, which is really what law, law and order is. So no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> and did you, I want, when you were doing poli sci, yeah. did you think to yourself, maybe I'll be a politician someday? Um, well, during my undergrad in poli sci, actually, probably a pivotal thing that got me onto politics, other than the obvious of talking about political science, is um, probably about my third or fourth year of uh, my poli sci degree. I wanted to, I'd been working in restaurants, you know, I'd been working a lot in there, but I wanted to have something, I guess, a little bit what I thought would be more professional on my resume. So I actually heard through the grapevine that my local MLA was looking for a summer student. Um, And so sort of on a whim, I I decided, I was like, you know what, maybe I should apply for that. I'm doing a poli-sci degree. It seems to make sense. I didn't really know much about my local MLA, but I... um, yeah, I applied for this, the summer student position and thus began a mentorship relationship that uh, to this day, I just got an email just like last week from her. And this is MLA Lori Blakeman, who was the um, MLA for Edmonton Center for quite some time. Um, she had just won her second election when I, um, when I joined her office. Um, and here I saw a very uh, committed, passionate, uh, articulate, woman in politics. Um, I saw that she believed very strongly in what she was doing, and she had a platform by which to convey her her thoughts and views. Um, 
we had a working relationship for a couple of years, um, and then it became more of a you know a mentor, a friendship actually. Um, so I think that's where I got my first sort of taste of true politics was watching her and working in her office. And later I uh, I decided to, well, she asked me to um, chair two of her campaigns. So after I returned uh, back to Edmonton uh, in 2008, she, well, this is the way Lori always did it. She didn't ask. I shouldn't say she asked. Lori doesn't ask things. She just said, so you're going to chair my campaign. And it wasn't a question. And I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know how to chair a campaign, Lori. She's like, ah, you'll figure it out. And, you know, when you have somebody who's, like, that competent, who just innately believes in your own competence, it kind of makes you be like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I can do this. Um, and, yeah, so I, I ran her 2008 and uh, co-chaired her 2012 campaign. And, yeah, it definitely got my taste of politics there. And what did you – it's interesting to just be thrust into such a – seems like a pivotal role like that. Yeah. Um, but you talked a little bit about how someone, I don't know, believing in you or someone who is competent and then gives you a chance. And I yes. think that's, that resonates with a lot of people. So mm-hmm. what did you take away, if anything, from those uh, – well, I mean, I'm sure lots of things. But what did you take away from that experience? Um, so, you know, I actually feel like Lori was just the first person in my life who was like that, who was somebody – and it goes to, you know – you really don't know who you're going to meet and who's going to change your life and really shape your life in certain ways. Um, But it's absolutely true. I think I want to say particularly as a woman that when you have a strong woman who just gives you the opportunity and trusts you to be able to do things, um, it it helps you find that within yourself to rise to it. Right. And I I never, I just, I, I knew that Lori believed in me and I later on actually had a work experience and and a a director at the legal team in Alberta education where I worked for eight years, who was very similar. She, there was no ego about it. It was simply like, she was like, well, you're smart, you'll figure it out. And I trust you to do it. And I was like, well, thanks. I'm going to run with that. Right. And, um, and I think particularly for, um, young people or young women in particular, if you get into envir- situations, either work, volunteer, study, where you can find somebody who will give you some free reign to kind of find your own voice and do your own thing, but will is there to help you when you have questions. Uh, I, I was very fortunate to have many experiences like that, and a, a few which I've talked about which really stick out, but that's... Um, Absolutely. I, I, I have no doubt that that was critical to why I felt confident enough to go into politics by myself and confident enough in my legal career to kind of take steps and take on projects that were quite big. Just I had people who believed in me. You think it's something that just accelerates the process yeah. or do you think it's something that is necessary for people to take that next step? Hmm, that's a good question. I, for me, I think it ex- it Excel, well, when I think about the my work experience when I was working for that director who believed in me, I think that accelerated it for me because I think she, when I started working there, I was right out of articling. I'd just been called to the bar in both Ontario and Alberta, essentially a first year um, lawyer. And she was letting me take the lead on projects that I think would be unheard of for young lawyers. And it allowed me to gain an expertise in an area, in lots of areas, that I don't think I would have had had I not had somebody who was just like, take it, go. If you make a mistake, I'm here. Um, so I think I seemed more um, experienced than I was uh, for my early part of my career because I'd gotten an opportunity to just take on big projects. Um so for in that situation, I think it absolutely accelerated. Now, like Lori, with the the mentorship and the faith in me about politics, that had to brew for some time, right? I had to. I mean, you make a you make a decision to run, and it's a it, it, you don't. For me, it's like you can wait for perfect times, and that that doesn't exist. You sometimes I describe it as a perfect storm. When I decided to run, it was a perfect storm of things. It had been lingering in my mind for years that I believed in it, but it, it I don't think it would have happened any other moment right now than the moment it happened. One thing I want to go back because you talked about how you worked two jobs yeah. in your undergrad. Yeah. How many hours a week do you figure? Um, so I was so my last year and a bit of my undergrad, year and a half, maybe like three semesters. I was probably working. Um, there was points there where I was working five nights a week at a restaurant. So usually about um, 
working from about five to six to close, which was about one o'clock in the morning. Uh, and then I was working uh, at, at Lori's constituency office, I'd say two days a week. Um, and that's why I was doing part-time classes. Like I wasn't full-time. Uh, but then I added on to that at one point, studying for the LSAT as well. Um, I've always been a person who takes on pay po- possibly more than I should in a day. Um, but I it gave me that nice balance of work that was really uh, interesting and satisfying. I was working in the constituency office, but I also needed to pay rent and I was paying my own tuition. And um, so I, you know, the restaurant work was necessary for that. Um, but I, I, you know, I, to me, I guess I never felt this huge pressure that I had to finish school in four years. Like there was, uh, I was like, you know, I'm taking classes, I'm interested, I'm engaged in them, I'm also paying my own way you know, and I'm supporting myself and I'm learning things in, a, in another job. So I, I was less hung up sort of on that. I need to graduate by a certain time. It was more like, well, I needed to do a bunch of different things. And well, yeah. and it seems to me that you also seem to embrace the courage to make the changes when you want to follow a different path. And what I mean by that is you talk about your undergraduate experience. You started off, your, you were in sciences. You thought mm-hmm. you were going to get into medicine and you realized that wasn't going to work out yeah. for you. I think some people would be more hesitant and they'd be like, well, I have to see this through. What is it mm-hmm. What is it that makes you, you know, and then what, you switch from that to, what was it? Um, <laughs> commerce, yeah. Commerce, become, yeah. and then history, and then yeah. finally poli-sci. I guess, um, you know, maybe it's an innate optimism. I don't know, but I think I always sort of felt like I would do best when I was interested in what I was doing. And I, I definitely saw that reflected in my marks in undergrad. Like I, like I sometimes look back at my transcripts. Don't do it anymore, but I used to look back at my transcripts. Um, and you could see like a, a marked change in my marks as the time goes on because as I grew more interested in what I was doing, I was doing better at it. Um, and it's because I was, I was engaged, right? And I know when I started undergrad, I mean, I came out, I was, a, I was a very good student in high school. I, you know, had great grades. And right away, the fact that I was sort of struggling with science and commerce made me go, this can't be right, because I, I, I know I'm an intelligent person. I'm a hardworking person. I, if I'm not doing well, it's because I'm not interested. Um, and so I guess I thought, I've got to figure out how to get back to doing well, and I have to find something I'm, I'm good at. And... If I think about my journey through school and work, that is consistently a theme is find out what you're good at because you can't be good at everything. Like to me, I'm, I'm one of those people that's like, if I'm not doing well at it, it's not right for me. So um, I've got to find something else. Um, and that's what even during work, whatever it is, it's like, oh, if, I, if I'm just doing mediocre, it's probably not the right thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe it is just that faith that it will sort itself out and it will work itself out. To go back to when you were talking about getting opportunities, going about getting those chances when people are giving you like uh, responsibility or projects to take on, how much of that was you suggesting you wanted to take them on? How much of it was them just having faith in you based on your other work? Mm -hmm. Well, I think sometimes the... uh... (laughs) <laughs> the I guess confidence of being younger sometimes that I felt was I was I was probably throwing my hand up for things that I probably wasn't qualified for but I was like yeah, I'll try that <laughs> and it was like and then to have somebody who was actually reciprocating and saying okay go ahead um I I guess uh yeah, I think it's probably it's uh, maybe it's good fortune right to have the two come together. I am somebody who is um okay with a little bit of um, uncertainty or okay with a learning curve, which is clearly what's happening to me right now. Um, And uh, because I I guess maybe I just have this confidence that I'll I'll figure it out. And if I don't, it's not the right thing for me. And um, so I do think I threw up my hand quite a bit and said, like, you know, it's particularly work situation, my first, you know, long-term job at Alberta Education, the legal team there, I definitely was at the very, from the very beginning saying, well, I'll try that or I'll do that. Or do you need somebody on that? I can help out with that. Um, and, uh, cause I don't like being bored. Mm. <laughs> I like, I'm somebody who hates being bored. And I can so, <laughs> so, uh, to just wait for things to come is boring. And so I, yeah, I think I just stepped forward and, and said, I'll, I'll try it. And, um, luckily had people who were saying, okay, I mm-hmm. trust you to do it. Sort of yeah. making yourself available. Yeah. Uh, and then the opportunities come. Yeah. 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit about being a lawyer mm -hmm. and your time there and what you learned and then when you decided and how you decided to sort of leave law and try and mm -hmm. try out politics. Mm -hmm. um, so here's what I say. I, I feel like I've maybe, you know, I've talked about how you find your passion or you find things you're interested in and you do it and if you don't, you move on. One of the things, though, I discovered uh, you know, when you come out of law school, I was one of those people who was like, I'm going to go to law school and change the world, right? The cliche law student. That was definitely me. And then I went to like the biggest corporate commercial law firm in Toronto and went to a super corporate law school. And I was like, wait, how am I changing the world here? And I do, I do definitely, like, I don't want to, you know, make it seem like I was super knowledgeable about what I was going to do. Because I feel like I went through most of law school and at least the articling year very confused about what I wanted to do. Um, because I felt, you know, I kind of went to this big fancy law school. Um, there was people there who seemed to be very confident in what they were doing, who knew exactly where they wanted to go. And... Um, I was, I flailed for sure. That for like during law school, I look back on those years and those were tough because I was trying to figure out, I'm like, I thought I knew who I was, but then I get here and I'm surrounded by people who are a little different and have different values. And they were going a lot and not everybody, but a lot of the people there were going to law school because they wanted to go work at a big Bay Street firm. And they come from like a long line of lawyers in their family, made lots of money. And I didn't know where to fit in there. And I took all the classes. I applied for the corporate commercial firm because everybody was doing it. And I did it too because I thought, well, I have student loans to pay off. I need a good job. I need to pay those bills off. And I did it. And I just felt, felt lost, most of it. And during articling in particular, um, I can honestly say, and I hope nobody from my old law firm is listening, but I can honestly say I had no idea what I did that article. Like, honestly, like what the work I was doing, like I felt like I'd be sitting in rooms with boxes of documents comparing things and making lists, but I had no concrete idea how what I was doing was part of anything bigger. Um, I didn't even understand how it fit in in the, in the specific file I was on oftentimes, right? So I was like, I don't know. I've just been given these documents to compare and I'm doing it. Um, and that was really heart. I didn't, I struggled a lot because I thought this isn't saving the world. I'm not doing anything. Um, and I, um, yeah, I, I made an actually really bold choice at the end of my articling year, which was really gutsy and sort of maybe stupid at the time, but it worked out okay, thankfully. I just uh, withdrew my name to be considered for hiring back as an associate. Like you go through articling and the goal is you want them to offer you a position to, as an associate. And I just told them I don't want to be considered for an associate position. And they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, And I just knew that I couldn't keep doing that because I didn't know what I was doing and it didn't feel good. Um, and uh, what I ended up doing was applying for internships and I went to um, uh, I went to South Africa. I went to Johannesburg for six months and worked in uh, on a Canadian Bar Association, Foreign Affairs Canada, Human Rights Internship in Johannesburg. It was unpaid. I actually probably lost money <laughs> during the process. Um, and it was there while I was there that I started looking for jobs back home in Edmonton um, and uh, came across this government job and decided to come come back and work in government because all of a sudden that felt like a little bit more like, okay, that's that might be work that I'm supposed to be doing, that it has a little bit more impact. So, It's kind of interesting for me to see it from this perspective because I think if I just looked at your list of jobs and yeah. I just looked and I saw okay MLA lawyer um, I would think that you had this driven path and you just went ahead and did it but you seem to be someone who's willing to take their time to find out what's right for them um, yeah, I think that's true. And I think um, I like sometimes I like I absolutely know that on paper, it looks like I did the pretty typical route, right? Like poli sci, law mm -hmm. school, lawyer, yeah. politician, right? And it does seem that and, and like, I won't, I won't discount the fact that back in my head for some time, you know, running for office was there. But I, it, it wasn't like I, it was a planned out route. It absolutely wasn't planned out. Like every every decision point was like, I didn't know I wanted to be a lawyer before I decided to apply for law school. Like, and and um, I just sort of, um, I guess, spent the time to figure out uh, if I liked what I was doing and if I didn't. That's not necessarily a failing on my part. It's because not everybody's meant to do everything. And so what what did I like about what I was doing? And how can I find something that fits more in that path? You know, and um, even as a lawyer, like I loved my work with Alberta Education. I did that for eight years. It felt like I was really contributing to great public policy development. I love my colleagues. I felt really good about my work. Um, but the conditions of the job started to change and it started to become a real... 
um, really difficult. And so then I made another career change after eight years and decided to go work. Well, not not a huge leap, but I decided to leave government and to work uh, for school boards. And I will be honest, that decision was actually based at that point in my life. Um, I had just had my first child. I had my son. And I actually made that decision less about the job and more about uh, it was the right move for my family at the time. And and. I think it's really important to highlight, especially for uh, young people who want to think about jobs and family and how you balance that, there's going to be times when you might make decisions about a job that isn't about, is this going to give me personal growth and the best, like, is this going to be personally fulfilling in the absolute way I want it to be? Sometimes you're going to make decisions, I think, about jobs that are right for your family and right for your time of your life. At that time in my life, I needed a job that was a little bit more stable, that you know, it, what I was being offered was better salary, it was better, more time at home with my family, and I just had a baby, and I thought, you know what, right now, that is more important to me. The work might not have been as fulfilling because it wasn't public policy development, but I thought, you know what? this is the right shift to make for me, for my family right now. Um, and what I discovered about that is you don't know what doors are going to open up um, from there because, um, you know, I met a lot of great people doing that work. Maybe the job itself and the work itself wasn't the most fulfilling, but I made incredible connections and support, which when I got to the point of running for office, those people came out big time for me and uh, personally supported me and so yeah I think things I think you make job changes for a lot of different reasons and it's okay if they're not always about it's your dream job you know I think sometimes you're going to make choices because it's the right thing for you right then and I especially as a young person I feel like don't feel like the first job you're going to take is going to be what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life because it won't be. It really won't be. And I think I'm a testament to that. You will, things will take turns. Um, and you just got to learn how to like identify those moments and those turns, but don't feel like you have to pick the dream job every time. I want to go back to talking about volunteerism. Mm. As you mentioned, you volunteered with Parity EYEG. Yeah. Uh, how have volunteer experiences helped you? Uh, so I, I think I've been volunteering uh, my whole life. Like I think I, I even going back to high school, I think it, it, at all points in my life I'm doing some kind of volunteer work. I've always been doing volunteer work. And what I actually found, so a couple things. I'd say when you're in school and even when you're working jobs, which maybe aren't the dream jobs, volunteerism is the way to fulfill your passions a little bit, right? Like I found like – you know, even when I was doing the job that wasn't the most like fulfilling in terms of work, but I was, uh, I, for example, I was uh, on the board of directors and was the adoption coordinator for a dog rescue group for, uh, for three years, uh, placing a lot of you know rescue dogs in homes, and I loved that. Like it was completely satisfying to be able to do something outside of my own time, uh, that was genuinely fulfilling for me. Um, uh, I've yeah I've volunteered at legal clinics I've volunteered I you know sat with I sat on Leaf Edmonton which is uh, Women's Legal Education and Action Fund which is about equality and the Charter of Rights um, so I, yeah I think uh, volunteerism has been a big part of my life in fact probably the only times I kind of took a little break from them is when I had kids like my first year of like having babies um because it was really hard to manage um but other than that it was like the first was way to get back to myself so one thing I'd say is volunteerism is a really good way to um a fulfill your passions in lots of different ways and to experiment in finding out what you're interested in right like you you do like I've done dog rescue I've done legal work I've done you know like and it's like you do figure out what you just do what you love like volunteerism is an opportunity to just find find cool stuff, meet cool people and do cool things. But you also meet people. Um, and again, so many times in the uh, in the work that I was doing or the moments that I needed support, <laughs> I found that uh, people that I'd volunteered with came out and um, they came out to support me because they knew me for my, my volunteer work. Um, I also think that you develop skills from volunteering. You, oh, particularly for campaigning and for particularly for being politically active, like biggest part of running a campaign is that you are uh, you're managing volunteers right mm -hmm. you're inspiring volunteers like you're asking people to give up their time their money their you know their their energy to come volunteer for you and they might not know you at all so how do you do that you've got to motivate them you've got to make them feel you know rewarded you've got to make them feel engaged and appreciated um, and how did I know how to do that well I'd been a volunteer right and I knew what had worked and what didn't work um, 
So yeah, it's it's a great way to find out what you care about, to meet people, and to develop incredible skills, for sure. You talked a lot about changes in your careers. I wonder if there was ever a moment where you felt really stuck. I think I was reaching that point, actually. Um, uh, well, I, I definitely during articling, I felt stuck. Um, and definitely, um, I think... Around the time that I was, um, uh, you know, just making a decision to run for office, I don't think that I felt necessarily stuck. I think I'm sort of like a, I'm such a big optimist that I'm like, well, even if this isn't the, you know, the ideal thing I want to be doing, here's what's good about it. You know, like I always find like advantages or pluses about it. I'm like, this isn't ideal, but it gives me this and it gives me that, or I'm meeting good people and I'm getting to, you know, maybe take on work I hadn't taken on before or I'm getting paid better than I was before, right? So those are things that you, I kind of tend to maybe oversell in my mind. And I've got friends who will say, oh, yeah, that's totally racky. She's always like, I get a bad haircut. I'm like, well, it's not really exactly what I wanted, but I think I'm pretty okay with it. I'm kind of like one of those people. I've always been that way. Um, and then you get out of it, and then you're like, oh, that wasn't that wasn't good. Like, um, I felt that way about articling. I didn't realize how miserable I was in articling until I got out of it. Um, so... Yeah, I, you know, maybe I, I tend to be the person who tries to make the best of bad situations, um, which can lead to like a little bit of, of getting, feeling a little stuck. But, and it's like now that I'm doing something that I'm incredibly engaged in and feel passionate about, I look back and think, oh, I don't, I don't know if that was, that was a good time for me. <laughs> I was not doing this, right? Like, uh, I'm trying not to burn any bridges here by talking bad about any oh, previous no. jobs. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, that probably wasn't the right fit for me. Yeah. I think it's time for the old lightning round, brought to you by TD Insurance, our preferred car, home, condo, and renter's insurance affinity partner. We're just going to throw these questions at you, yeah. and you can answer them. Have you ever been fired? Yes, I have been. Yes. Somebody <laughs> finally has been fired. Yep. I was fired. I worked at uh, Planet Hollywood in Edmonton. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was brief, brief. Well, I worked at Planet Hollywood in London, England, and then they opened one in Edmonton. And I worked here, and I think it was my third month in, I told the manager that I thought I could do a better job than she was doing, Ooh. and she let me go. <laughs> so I think it was actually insubordination was the uh, was the word used. And I thought, you know what? I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> Planet Hollywood's lost. <laughs> when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, I actually think I wanted to be a writer. I used to love, I was, and, which is funny because I don't necessarily think creativity is my strength, but what I think I was channeling was I like to write long things. Like I like to write for long periods of time, which actually meant I was probably meant to be a lawyer. What's something you wish people knew about your job? My current job as an MLA, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> you know what? Like I keep almost feeling guilty that I'm having so much fun doing this because you know, I'm fighting really hard and I'm arguing really hard about things that are really near and dear to people. But it's really fun to get up there and really go at it and say, like, I get to actually say things that I really believe, which I like for a lawyer, I spent 13 years trying to like couch it in proper legal terms. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just gonna get up and say what I think. And it's funny, because you kind of have to be careful because it's politics, you don't want to say anything that's going to get you in hot water. But at the same time, I'm having I'm having a lot of fun. What do you think you'd be doing if you weren't in this job? Still a lawyer, I assume? Still a lawyer. Still a lawyer. Yeah, I can't see where I would have shifted at any time soon. So yeah, probably still a lawyer. If you could go back in time and talk to yourself just after graduation, mm. do you have any advice you'd give yourself? So just after graduation from my undergrad, I think I took myself too seriously in terms of law school. I absolutely think that I really had the sense that I had to do something really important right away. I actually, if I could have done it a little differently, I would have taken some time off between going between graduating and um, going to law school. I wish I had figured out, spent a little more time to work some different jobs and get a little bit better sense of how to focus myself better in law school. Because I got in and I think I got swept away. So I think I'd tell myself, just chill out. You don't have to do it all right now. <laughs> Take a little time. That's excellent. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much Thank for doing you. this show I with me. I appreciate it. This is fun. Thank Good you. luck with your time in office. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for checking out this episode of What the Job. Special thanks to our guest, Racky Pancholi. And if you're looking for a way to share career resources with other U of A alumni, try out Switchboard at uab.ca slash sboard. It's free to use and a great tool no matter where you are in your career journey. For What the Job, I'm Matt Ray. Thanks for listening.